Hello from Emerald Hill Skies. My name's Doug and it's great to have you here tonight. <clears throat> Thanks to all of you who are here to start with. I see, um, I see several folks who are kind of, Mariana actually brought donuts for everybody. H how can you not love that? Uh, thanks, Mariana. And as Ray is ready to go, um, Jen, 0714, she didn't think about donuts, but she does have goldfish crackers, and they're actually pretty popular. Um, I think okay. maybe Jennifer is, is from Atlanta, and uh, Jen, good to have you here from Atlanta. If you are on the live stream tonight, you wouldn't mind just saying where you're from. Go ahead and log on. We're going to look in the constellation Coma Berenices tonight here in the southern part of the sky. If you can see here, I'll actually get you over to the screen. Here's our planetarium software, Starry Night Pro Plus, and here's the south part of the sky. If you look up just a little bit to the right from that, you can see the little simple constellation Coma Berenices. Let's get some other constellations up there so you can see um, the way these fit in with everything else in the sky. So you can see... Um, uh, Boote's there is that one we talked about last time that looked like an ice cream cone you crawl. Maybe you're a kite. Can you see the kite there? Uh, over to the right of the meridian, the meridian being the, the line that would draw between the south, uh, you know, compass point up through the zenith, which is straight up, and then all the way to the north part of the sky. It would kind of divide or intersect uh, divide the sky in half. There's Coma Veronese's. You can see that we've got our little red square there. Nothing related to the red square in Moscow, of course. And you can see we've got Black Eye Galaxy highlighted there. And uh, that red rectangle is approximately the uh, field of view that our Rasa 11 has. And if you want to see what that looks like, there's our Rasa 11. And you can see it pointed up in the sky. That's a live view uh, over here to the to the left, uh, that, that's the Ross 11. And the Ross 11 is a unique telescope. It has a big 11 inch aperture, a big mirror in the back. And then in front, it has uh, a, a corrector plate. And we put this, uh, this camera on the front of the uh, corrector plate. It's a ZWOSI uh, 2600 MC Pro camera, if you're interested in that kind of thing. It's an APS-C size. Uh, frame. And then on top of the scope, we have this uh, little outrigger plate, uh, an equipment plate, and it has a, a an ASI, uh, a Z, ZWO ASI 178 mono camera that lets us see about 150 degrees of the sky. And that's the camera we were using last time, you might recall, when we looked at all the uh, the meteors. Actually, there weren't all the meteors. There were like one meteor every 10 minutes maybe, uh, but it didn't turn out to be the storm that we'd all hoped. Uh, thanks to all those who joined. Uh, then we've got on that corrector plate also a, a Pegasus Astro pocket power box uh, to be able to power up the scope and some of the accessories. And then underneath that, a USB hub that's there. So that's kind of a rundown of the equipment that we have. This is what the sky looks like. That's that ASI-178 uh, monochrome camera, the one we were using to look for meteors last time. But I'll tell you what, let's go over to now our ASI 2600 MC Pro, which is actually uh, running through the Rasa 11. And this is a live view of the sky. Uh, let's, uh, let's do a color balance here. And uh, we'll bring these blacks over Somewhere on, I don't know if I like that color balance that well. Uh, that's a little better. We'll bring these blacks over somewhere around this, this black point. Uh, maybe leave a little bit of, of the sky glow. We're in Louisville, Kentucky, just on the outskirts of Louisville, where, by the way, the, um, the Bortle rating, if you're into that sort of thing, is around Bortle 6. And we'll put it right around there, and then we'll bring those mids up a little bit, but can you see uh, M64, the Black Eye Galaxy, can you see it starting to uh, peek out there? Uh, M stands for Messier, the, from the Messier catalog. Uh, it's, it's the Black Eye Galaxy's name for the prominent dark lane near its center. The dark lane is a dust cloud which hides the background stars and is itself an area of active star formation. That dark lane 
Uh, you can't always see it through every telescope. We're going to see if we can pull it in here in a second. And you have to have a combination of dark skies and high magnification before you can detect it. Um, and you can see the soft glow of M64 in binoculars uh, before you take a closer look in a telescope. We're going to continue this observation here. Let's see if we can bring this in. I think we're going to we're going to kind of uh, zoom in here, and sure enough, we're seeing that uh, black eye there. See, that's at about 100% uh, right there of what our Rasa sees native. Um, kind of hold your head. What would you have to do? Hold it on its left side. <laughs> you can see that. Let's see what, where some of our folks are from here. Uh, Flatwater is enjoying the donuts and is saying thanks, of course, to uh, Mariana for bringing those. Uh, Anthony, good to have you here. Azri says it's actually National Donut Day, which I didn't know. Uh, Flatwater's on from Dallas, Texas, Flatwater 5. Azra is on from Arizona. Um, and Flatwater 5, the, he sees the Aurora Borealis. That's pretty cool. Deb Baker is here uh, from Anaheim. Nice to have you on, Deb. Uh, good to have you guys here. Thanks for joining us. So this is the Black Eye Galaxy, or Messier 64. And what amazes me about this is that with electronically assisted astronomy, we don't really need jet black skies. Let's uh, look over again at that sky view. Can you guys see that light pollution that's there at the bottom of that frame? The, the little uh, black form that you see at the bottom of the sky view is the front end of the telescope. That's because you're looking at that uh, light pollution through this red camera that's riding on the front of that telescope. So there's a lot of sky glow there, see? But with this electronically assisted astronomy, which basically amounts to taking 20 second time exposures of the sky and then stacking them one on top of the other. We're able to pull in these photons and then average them together and the blacks get blacker and the lights get lighter that is able to make this really great structure. Let's, let's go in a little bit closer and I think you'll see some other dark lanes here. Boy, doesn't that look like a black eye except I think it's upside down. You kind of have to pitch yourself like this. You can see the black eye. I'm going to put here that M64 looked amazing tonight. We could clearly see the black under the eye. Actually, it was over the eye in the native view from our Rasa tonight. The black eye galaxy. All right, well, uh, we're going to take a picture of this, kind of save that image, and be able to see that exactly as seen, and then we'll put our sequencer back in um, next target mode. And what that does, it allows us to go find the next target. We've got uh, least of these on from Battle Lake, Minnesota. Thanks for joining us. That Aurora Borealis line is from a song by Dr. Teeth and the Electric Mayhem. That's a band I've never heard of before. I'm so sorry. Um, Flatwater 5 thought he got the name Black Eye Galaxy because it just wouldn't listen. <laughs> Somebody backhanded it, I think, is what he thought. Um, all right, let's go. We're, we're using tonight um, the best deep sky objects as our kind of um, home um, observing turf. So you can kind of see our planetarium software is sorting through all the objects that it could recommend to us as being the best deep sky objects tonight. And uh, then what we do is we sort them by altitude so we can get the very highest. You see, we've already done the Black Eye Galaxy. And uh, I think we'll say here, make a new list that just says uh, best DSO observed. And that way we can keep track of the ones that we've observed. We're going to add that to that observing list. Best DSO observed. Where is it here? Best DSO. Oh, it's already been added. Right there. It's checked. All right. So let's look at our the Sunflower Galaxy. How about that Sunflower Galaxy? You guys are thinking that that um, looks like the flower. Huh? So we'll check that. 
and we'll uh, slew to it. And we'll show the scope going there. And uh, then we'll center on it. Um, so the scope didn't have to move too much. You can see it kind of adjusting a little bit. In our screen view, you can see we are zoomed in on the Sunflower Galaxy. Let's come out a little bit and kind of see where we are in the night sky. So, let's see, that would be west, right under it. So there's west, and there's that meridian again. So you can make out the Big Dipper here, Ursa Major, and this is the handle of the Big Dipper, and there's the open cup. So the Sunflower Galaxy would be right underneath that handle before you get to Coma Berenices. You can see we were just here on the Black Eye Galaxy. So, uh, actually pretty close in a nighttime sky from where we were, between Canis Vanatici and the handle of Big Dipper. So this red rectangle, again, is going to show you roughly what our, our Rasa sees. And there you can see the, the uh, galaxy we hope to find right in the middle there. Let's open up our um, info pane. So I'll have that ready to roll here. And let's go over to our calendar. Let's, I can already see the um, Sunflower Galaxy kind of forming up there. We'll do our plate solve. So that way, you know, remember, we're going to match the view that the telescope sees with the view that we're seeing through um, the view that, that our telescope expects to see with the view that we're actually seeing. That's what we're doing here in this uh, plate solve. And this uses a stack of hundreds of pictures that are saved in memory. Looks like we are only 0.12 degrees off. So I guess that's probably because we didn't move very far. Our first three three or four targets of the night, there's typically a little bit of uh, correction that has to happen in order for the mount to kind of align itself with all of the movement of the nighttime sky. Looks like that's happened. So now we're going to um, go in our sequencer to start imaging. And while that's imaging, we're going to look here and see. Uh, so Flatwater 5, you can take heart because at least Deb Baker thought that your comment about the Black Eye Galaxy getting backhanded was kind of funny. Uh, now, least of these had a much more elaborate thought about Johnny Depp blacking out. Okay, I've been seeing him in the news lately. Something about a, a news story, a court case or something. Deb Baker, thank you, Flatwater5 says. I exist to amuse myself. There's Don. Good to see you, Don. Welcome. I forget where you're from, Don. Could you tell us where you're logging on from? Um, let's see. Uh, Deb Baker tries it. Spaced out. My goodness, I've learned more from your two live streams than I ever had in school. <laughs> uh, Spaced Out says, glad, is, glad I subscribed. You know, i got to say, if you... Look, we've just gotten photobombed by an airplane. That is unfortunate, isn't it? That's going to that's gonna be stuck there in our, in our sky. I think we're going to start the live stack over again. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm interrupting the live stack... And then we're going to start it again because, and then we'll clear it. Uh, because that airplane's uh, trail would never disappear. There's a setting that we can use uh, in SharpCap that is supposed to drop out uh, airplane trails. And I haven't really experimented with it yet, but it has to do with, um, I think it's Sigma clipping, is that it? I just haven't had a chance to experiment with it yet, but it's supposed to to uh, eliminate um, airplane and also um, satellite trails as well. And uh, I think it's right here, a sigma, sigma clipping is what you're supposed to do. So I don't know if you want to try that or not. We could try that in a minute. And, and if we see very many of these airplane trails, that's what we'll do. You can see already that uh, Sunflower Galaxy is um, is already shaping up here. I'm going to just put here in our title. Um, it's uh, M63, the Sunflower Galaxy, a spiral galaxy. You might notice that we're observing from inside tonight. Uh, this is where we normally like to observe. It looks like our temperature outside on the telescope. This is from a sensor mounted right on the telescope uh, through Pegasus Power Box. It's about 61 degrees, so it's not really cold out there, is it? It's just that you'd be just a little bit nippy with the dew coming down and everything. Um, 
So anyway, Spaced Out brings up a good point. I've learned more. My goodness, it's so kind of you, Spaced Out. I've learned more from your two live streams than I ever had in school in astronomy, I bet you're saying. And then he said, glad I subscribed. I just want to say, if you do like content like this, could I just gently, humbly, as the dust on the ground ask, if you would subscribe, what it does is it bumps up the channel and everybody else's searches a little bit more. If they search for things like galaxies, it'll bump it up. And I don't think it costs you a thing. Um, and you can always unsubscribe later if you don't like the content. If you do like the content, though, you could hit that thumbs up, and that, again, gets it higher in their searches. And also, if you want to be notified when we're doing this, you could hit the uh, bell. And that way, it lets you know. Don, Mount Nome, Idaho. I knew that. I knew you from Idaho. I, sorry, I forgot that. Nice to see 20 plus people. Make sure you like the stream, folks. Yeah, that's very kind of you, Dom. We actually had an amazing, um, I guess you'd call it some kind of viral response last time. The live stream was above 5,000 participants most of the time, and it resulted in 103,000 views so far on YouTube, which you guys were kind enough to push the subscribers. It, it actually brought us to above 3,800 subscribers, which to me, I still have a hard time believing. I think there's some kind of a mathematical error going on there. But anyway, that's what it said. Uh, least of these said I joined because I wanted to get my own telescope, but I can learn something here. Uh, <laughs> you are so kind. You're saying you're a very nice teacher. And uh, then you've got a big smile there. So least of these, very kind of you to um, to encourage like that. We can see our, our actual color balance is not so bad. Uh, we'll go ahead and do a color balance just to try again, but it's really not bad. And then we'll maybe bump over here a little bit by that blue. Look how we're getting a little bit of a green in. Let's zoom in a little bit here. Now you can see why this is called the, the Sumthog. I'm going to back off those greens a little bit and maybe bring the blues back up. And maybe just a speck of reds. You can, also, you can see how this is really just a... Um, it's kind of an art, an art form rather than specific technology. What I'm doing is I'm bumping up the reds a little bit just for, for balancing. I don't think our, there, I'm starting to see the blues again. Does it not help you guys though that I happen to be colorblind? I'm <laughs> kind of color deficient. So you're gonna have to help me out there and tell me what you think of that. There's a little bit of the, now let's go ahead and bump up the uh, mids a little. And that should help us see a little more of the structure. Now we are zoomed beyond the optical zoom. I think that's just a beautiful galaxy. Look at all that material that's being slung out. I often think of this as maybe if the person has a what? Let's suppose the person in the middle has a garden hose going. And as that person I'm going to see if I can spin in my chair. Will I break something? In my... Let's suppose that person started spinning around in his chair. I think I'm going to get dizzy if I go very much. The, the water would sling out, and as, as that circle would turn, there would be a spiral trace of the water that would be throwing out in the, into the, the yard. Well, that's what's happening here. This galaxy is uh, revolving around this bright hub, and it's spewing out all of those gaseous, uh, all that gas and dust and materials and star forming regions. And what we're seeing are all these arms, the spiral arms. This is not unlike what the Milky Way galaxy looks like. I uh, wonder what the size is on this. Let's see if we can figure out. Uh, M63 is a barred spiral commonly called the Sunflower Galaxy. In binoculars, its soft glow is readily apparent with nearby M94 visible in the same field of view. A telescope reveals a bright star-like core surrounded by a fainter halo. A hint of structure and spiral arms may be glimpsed with a larger instrument and dark skies, but the arms will remain patchy and faint. See, I think in, in electronically assisted astronomy, they actually don't uh, actually remain patchy and faint. We're seeing clear spiral structure here in just six minutes of integration time. So this is an amazing uh, technology. It's, the, it's the, the fast focal ratio of the telescope. It's, it has a focal ratio of f2.2 combined with the amazing ability of live stacking these images one on top of the other 
and uh, the that happens, of course, live within SharpCap. So we're not saving all these pictures to our hard drive and stacking them using Photoshop. This is happening all in the RAM of the computer. Man, look at the way you can start to see those spiral arms now. Let's save a view of that. I'm going to look and see if you guys have had any comments here. Um, Rock, good to have you on from Missouri. Goat Wave, you're so kind to talk about the uh, live stream on Monday. Uh, Don, uh, it was fun to see so many people come here. Hopefully they all, want to, they all wanted to see meteors, yeah. Andy, good to have you on from Arkansas. Azre, uh, it, that's very kind of you to say it looks great. We're actually at 211% of our optical zoom. Uh, if we were to back down, just to let you know, to our, ap that's our actual optical zoom. That's, that's the sharpest that the image is going to get. And anything we do to make it bigger is just showing you a little bit of the structure through what you might call the digital zoom. And I think it does let you see a little more of the structure, doesn't it? even though it goes a little bit pixelated. But again, that is the best that you can see optically. Um, <laughs> we, we are like you, Flatwater5. We think it's a record for simultaneously viewing the Infinity One Galaxy. In fact, in the YouTube analytics, you guys will be shocked by that, I think, because I was shocked and I still am. There was one point that YouTube analytics um, supposedly measured a, a grand total of 25,000 people that were viewing at the same time, but it was only for a very short period of time. The average remained in the 4,000 people range, and it, it did get up to 5,000 for some time. Taking pictures is so easy now. I wish I had updated equipment, Don says. Blayboy, good to have you back again from Bay Minette, Alabama. Blayboy. Uh, whoa, Dan used to, or Don used to use a, uh, Hand-guided film photographs with your 13-inch daub, that would be extremely intensive for me to try to do. Okay, so let's save one more picture of this, and uh, there is that picture, and then let's go to our sequencer and go to our next target. We had eight minutes of integration here, and let's do a quick uh, observation. Um, we saw lots of... Uh, star formation region out in the spiral arms of this beautiful galaxy. Just, I just say something there just to kind of make a memory. And then we'll also uh, add this to our um, best DSO observed list. So there you go. Uh, that's kind of the workflow. And uh, you know, for you guys who are, who are interested in astronomy, I think the best way to start is to begin trying to learn some of these constellations. And you can go out and do that just by going out into the night sky and looking up. You can see in the image here, this is just a wide view image of the night sky. Remember, you can see the Big Dipper here. Let's go back to our screen so I can gesture on the screen. Um, here's the handle of the Big Dipper and the open bowl. And remember that handle points over at Arcturus. You can remember that arc to Arcturus. And then remember we talked about Arcturus being at the bottom of this kite or club, if you'd rather think of it as a caveman club. Now let's go back and see that in planetarium software. So here's arc to Arcturus, and then here is the club or ice cream cone of Boates. So I think the best way to get started is to start learning some of these constellations. And then, uh, you know, everybody wants to go buy a telescope first. And I think it's always a good idea to buy a telescope. But maybe sometimes we could just learn constellations to get started. Let's go to the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's right here. And so what we'll do is we'll slew the scope to that. And we'll also center to it in our planetarium software. Let's see what you guys are saying here. Yolanda, good to have you on from Ansa, California. You are very kind to uh, have tuned in on Monday. And uh, Yolanda, it's a little bit better hour for you there, isn't it? Because here we are on the East Coast at 11.24. A lot of people are already hitting the sack. But you guys out there in Anza, it's just eight something. So De Debbie, thanks for, you're kind of like welcoming, welcoming people, Debbie. Thank you for, for doing that. 
Um, so here we are, Whirlpool Galaxy. Let's open up our little information pane about it. Um, let's see, show info. There's our little information pane. So it's M50, M51, of course. Let's go down to our title and uh, in our title say M51 um, Whirlpool Galaxy um, Interacting Spirals. You know, when we were on this object the other night, uh, I got to say it was it was indeed amazing, uh, as we've already said, because um, it it where there were so many people looking at the same time, and it wasn't some kind of astrophotography thing in which you know somebody had taken a picture and then gone out and processed it for seven hours. It was real time. So. Don, you are so kind to say keep the likes coming. Uh, that looks like Raleigh 920. Uh, how's it going? Good to have you on, Raleigh. Tell us where you're logging on from, if you don't mind. We have over 50 people here. My goodness, it's like a little community of people. Um, right there in the middle, you can see we've made a correction now of just four one hundredths of a degree. So you see with each correction, we are able to see the scope and the mount become a little more accurate. And what that's telling us is that it, it kind of stores the corrections cumulatively. So with each correction, it becomes a little more accurate at guessing were there a little bit of uh, inadequacies in like polar alignment or the way the mount is functioning. And by using this uh, plate solving technique, we, we sort of make up for those inadequacies. Oh wow, the first frame, after just 20 seconds, you can already see a beautiful shot of M51 there. Uh, we haven't color balanced or anything, but you can already see that it's already starting to show up. That's uh, literally 20 seconds. Now, notice all that. Uh, oh, what does that look like to you? You guys tell us what what does all this powdery stuff look like to you? I mean, it could you could say it looks like sand that's in the lens. You could say it's confetti. You could say it's um, a bunch of dust, it looks like. But what it really is, all this loose stuff out here is just noise caused mainly by the light pollution here in the suburbs of Louisville, Kentucky. Well, here's the thing about that noise. Thank the Lord. Um, it changes every time the camera snaps a picture. The noise is a little bit different. So what live stacking does, it discards the stuff that's not the same. And it stacks and guards and amplifies, or averages is probably a better way to describe it, the stuff that stays the same. So for instance, if, if there's a pixel here in the middle of M51 that's really bright, SharpCap dutifully keeps recording that and measures it as a bright pixel. But if there's a pixel out here that's bright one time and the next time it's dark, SharpCap discards the brightness in that one frame. And what that does is it gets rid of a lot of this noise. It takes a bit of time to get rid of all of it. What part of the sky are we looking at here? Let's go to our sky cam and uh, we can kind of see the exact part of the sky. Another way to do that is by looking uh, here in our planetarium software, uh, sometimes it's kind of tricky to make it go back to it, and you almost have to press here on the little icon at the bottom in order to get back to it. There we go. So you see we're aimed still in this major area of the Big Dipper, in between Canis Vanatici and the Big Dipper. So we're still aimed right there. That shows us the part of the sky we're in. By the way, look how we can find Leo the lion. And the way Leo works, this part is supposed to be his head. And then you've got this tail down here. So really, it's like the lion is, the way we're viewing it right now, the lion is, has leaped off of a mountain and is kind of leaping down to the ground. This is the lion's head. And there's the tail. Uh, so Denebola is the tail of Leo, bright star Denebola. So how can we find that? Let's take 
these pointer stars of the Big Dipper. So the inner part of the bowl, and let's let them point at the head of the lion. That might be one way. And then if you do that, while you've gone, you also get to the smaller lion, Leo Minor, and you kind of pass over him and you can kind of make a mental note. He's got a low self-esteem because you just skipped right over him to get to this. But this, this structure, it looks like a question mark. If you kind of, again, you kind of got to turn your head, kind of, kind of turn it sideways there. But if you, if you look, it's kind of like a question mark. That's the telltale sign. You're looking at the head of Leo, the lion. And then you go back here, this little triangle. The nebula is really easy to see, and it really does make a nice, um, you know, guide star with Arcturus to be able to, to, be able to see uh, Arcturus and the nebula. Another thing we can do, if we arc to Arcturus, you can keep this on going over here to this bright star, which is called Spica. And some people remember that because you arc to Arcturus, remember, and then you spike to Spica. So look at the way you're learning these constellations now, and when you go out in the night sky, you'll be able to see those and pick those constellations out when you look overhead, hopefully someday in some dark sky settings. Well, let's see how our picture is, is averaging up here. We're at four minutes. You want to uh, do another um, color balance. Let's do another color balance just to see what we come up with here. Oh my goodness, what a, what a mess that is. Two green, right? Two green. I kind of like what we're doing manually here better than what the uh, computers are. Now I'm bringing the blues up and then bringing the reds up until it just looks like it's balanced. Now see, there are too many reds in the sky there. This is, by the way, uh, looks like a satellite trail. Over here to the right, that's probably a satellite trail. I'm saying satellite because there aren't three little things like an airplane, I don't think, but it could be an airplane. Uh, now, maybe just a shade more blue. There's really no right or wrong. No, that's too much blue, see. Man, look at the bright core of M51. Now, this little uh, galaxy over here that's interacting with it, I think that's called M51A, but let's check over here in our planetarium software. What we'll do is we'll zoom in here, and they give it a different name, NGC5195. So M51 is interacting with NGC5195. How can we remember that? At least it starts with 51. But I've seen it written sometimes as just 51A, and that's a little easier to remember. This is the real-time view that you're seeing here. This is actually live through our telescope, whereas when we go to this view, this is in the, what you call, planetarium software that helps us find things in the night sky. So that's an astrophotographer's image, probably, for all we know, six hours, let's say, of, of integration time. And this is what we're already seeing after just six minutes. So a lot of detail, and all these arms are forming stars real time as you watch this. And let's see how far away this is. Let's go over here in our description. The Whirlpool Galaxy is arguably the most impressive galaxy for amateur astronomers. It is easy to locate with binoculars as it lies just three degrees northwest of Al-Qaeda, the star at the end of the Big Dipper's handle. The Whirlpool is a face-on galaxy, which means we're viewing it as if from the top down, looking at the entire plane of the spiral uh, disk, you see. Um, so it makes its spiral structure easy to observe. A telescope, dark skies, and moderate power begin to reveal the spiral arms. M51 has a bright central core, but no stars can be resolved in the bright central core. I'd say that's probably true. The core likely contains a supermassive black hole, and sometimes people um, abbreviate those SBH. Of special interest is the bridge of nebulosity that connects M51 to its companion galaxy, NGC 5195. NGC 5195. So here's that bridge. Let's bring those mids up a little more and see if we can accent that bridge. There we go. So when we bring that up, it reveals that we've got a little bit too much red. I don't really mind that view much, even though the blues are still pretty strong, huh? But um, it looks right. Now look at the dust. 
in that nebulosity. Isn't that an amazing sight? Uh, recent research suggests that the gravitational pull of NGC 5195 is causing star formation in the world of galaxy. I'm just going to look and see what you guys might have said. Uh, what's up? Says hi. That's an appropriate thing for you to say what's up. I don't know where you're observing from, but tell us where you're observing from if you don't mind. Andy says, early this morning around 5.30 a.m. I looked out toward the eastern sky and saw what appeared to be four objects all having what looked like four lights. Yeah, I think that's the planetary display now that we have on display in the morning sky. So that would be, if I remember right, Saturn, Jupiter, Venus, and would the fourth one have been Mercury? Uh, we'll have to look that up in a minute. Jen0714 with apologies to Joni Mitchell. Flatwater 5, you are very kind to say magnificent, brother. Uh, Blay Boy, our local weatherman, has always lets us know when the space station is going to be visible crossing. It's kind of cool to watch it cross the sky. It is, indeed. Uh, Dane Christensen, are there any examples of galaxies that are not face-on? How thin are they? Uh, what are we looking at? We're looking at M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, I am... I don't even know how to pronounce that. Um, let's look at Dane. Let's go find a galaxy that is a disk. Are there any examples of galaxies that are not face-on? How thin are they? Let's go find one that's thin. Um, let's save a picture of this, save an image of it just for keepsake and then save an observation here. We're going to say, tonight M51 seemed especially, especially uh, clear for some reason. We could especially make out, it's too many especiallys, isn't it? We could, um, without problem, how about that, make out the bridge of nebulosity, I like the way they said that, bridge of nebulosity between M51 and, what was it? Anybody remember? Uh, NGC, I think it was 5195, wasn't it? Interacting with M51. That's awesome. So again, like we said the other night, what we're really seeing here is kind of like a bit of a tug of war. And you can see 10 minutes is plenty to get a nice image of this. Now we're at 125%. Let's zoom in a little more past our optical zoom, just again to get a picture, more or less, of the spiral structure. You can see those spiral arms really clearly when we zoom it in this big, can't you? You know what always amazes me about stuff like this is that this, this galaxy is always up there. It's always up there in the night sky. And we go out and we view the night sky and we just sort of take it all for granted, don't we? Um, but it's always up there. And if, if you guys stop and think about it, these objects keep their position with all the stars as the stars glide or appear to glide across our sky east to west, which we know is actually because the Earth is rotating in the opposite direction. That makes it look like the stars are gliding past us. Well, these objects always keep their same place in the night sky. And so we can find them again and again and again. We can find them because of the fact that uh, they are always in the same relative position of the stars. Now, what I've done now is I've moved the black level a little bit to the right, clipped off some of the light pollution, which does create more um, contrast between the uh, object here and also the night sky. And then what I did there is drop the blues down a little bit. Which do you like better? I'll be the eye doctor again. A or B? That's A or B. I'm going to see if you guys have a preference. Um, yeah, Don's pointing out Sabrero Galaxy is indeed edge-on. Um, Don says, that's a great photo of M51. The most amazing thing is it's only 12 minutes long, and to really do a nice photo of M51, everybody just assumes you have to have six hours of integration. But with electronically assisted astronomy, stacking these frames like this, you can do this real-time, live, and what helps is to have a fast ratio telescope. This is f2.2. 
I wonder if the smaller galaxy is further away than the larger one. Blade Boy, that's a really good question. I don't know if we were to go here. The Whirlpool Galaxy is said to be Does it really say how far it is? It doesn't. So let's go out to Google. Um, right. Where is Google? I've lost it. Let's go out to Google. And uh, that's, uh, by the way, a beautiful view of um, the first object that we looked at, the black eye galaxy. Let me get this little observing um, logging. That was the black eye galaxy. You can see the black eye a lot better in the Hubble image. This is the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> now with the with the black on the bottom, it really does look like a black eye, doesn't it? And look at all those stars forming in the Hubble view. Wow. Anyway. Let's go back here and let's look for um, M51 wiki. And that'll take us to the um, Wikipedia. It's um, 31 million light years. Now, let's go back over here. So remember that. Help me remember that, guys. 31 million. So M51 is at 31 million. Now let's see if we can go to NGC 5195 and show info on it and see if it tells us how far away it is. It doesn't. So let's uh, let's go back here and say NGC 5195 wiki and see if somebody's been kind enough. And they did. Thank you to the people who did this. Um, well, this says both galaxies, M51. Oh, look. This is exactly what I was saying a while ago. NGC 5194 is also known as M51A. So... Thank you for putting that down so people didn't think I was making that up. Um, ah, look. It's not. M51A is... the part of the M51 structure that is the bigger. So it's called M51A. And the other would be 51, M51B. So we learned something tonight. M51B is NGC 5195. And anyway, this Wikipedia entry says both are located approximately 25 million light years away. You can see the last article said 30. <laughs> didn't it say 35? So plus or minus 10 million light years. This is not an exact science, folks. <laughs> so uh, the answer to your question then is um, who asked that question? Oh, don't stop for my question, man. I was thinking and typing. No, it's a good question, Playboy. Hubble, yes. Just majestic, right. Phoebe, good to have you aboard, Phoebe. Tell us where you're observing from, if you don't mind. Uh, Debbie, you're so kind to encourage. You guys, when you encourage like that, you're just like, you're just like throwing gasoline on the fire here. James Webb Space Telescope's going to expand our knowledge. Right, and they're going to start releasing images I saw just today as of mid-July. They're going to start releasing their first images. I just can't imagine 31 million numbers. That's why I didn't become a meteorologist. <laughs> well done, Jen. Uh, that is difficult. And then there's uh, another person saying hello. There's Phoebe. Wow, far out. I love that, Phoebe. Uh, I get it. Dane, small margin of error, plus or minus 10 million light years. <laughs> yeah. All right, one last time. Let's go back to our live image. So this is the live image now through our... Um, let's get rid of our... How can we how can we get rid of the white angle back there? Let's put this back there. Or else maybe we just maybe we just minimize that. How about that? That'll get rid of that screaming white image back and back. One more time, that's 17 minutes at M51. It's certainly worth a bit of a stopping off point. Wow, look now we're really seeing the black dust here. Isn't that amazing? That this black dust is covering up. Let's go ahead and zoom in on that. 
this black dust is covering up the nebulosity. And that's just like soot. Imagine the candle flame making soot on the bottom of your, you know, saucer that you're holding over the top of the candle flame, and it makes it sort of blackened. Well, this is just simply carbon and soot and dust uh, that's blocking some of that nebulosity. It is a striking photo, isn't it? I mean, to see these arms this clearly and to see this tug of war that they're in, this ballet dance, it kind of looks like, you know what this reminds me of is some kind of a dance. Let's just go look at one here um, of that interaction. So um, anyway, that's M51, uh, saving one more picture and uh, then switching over to the um, next target. And uh, let's see, so, so again, coming back here, we've done the Whirlpool. Okay, let's find a, an edge on Galaxy now. Let's go, for instance, to, do you want to see if um, uh, the Sombrero Galaxy is, is up tonight? Let's see. See, center on that. Yes, it should still be up. Right. Now let's slew there. So we're going to slew the scope there. Going to look and see what you guys are. Dance of the Galaxies, exactly. Okay, Don, we're headed there. Um, so we've slewed there. And just to get um, oriented, this galaxy is located just over the southwestern sky. So here's south, and here's southwest. And we're only up about 31 degrees above. Now, you guys remember, to figure out degrees, you can hold out a fist, and that's uh, 10 degrees. And you can put another fist, that's 20. And then the next is 30. So that's where it would be, just 30 degrees up, uh, 10 degrees roughly per fist. Let's go over in our uh, live view now through our ZWO 2600. And let's do another plate solve just to make sure we keep adding to our uh, mount corrections so that our, our mount will become more and more accurate as the night goes on. And let's see if we can find out if, our, if we have any problems here. The ISS is going to be visible at 22 minutes after the hour. Cool. Um, it was a 0.45 degrees off. And we slewed to a different part of the sky. Now what you see now, these little trails, that's the telescope moving to the new location. And as it moves, it's catching some of that, that movement in the time exposure. But what this did is it, you can see now the Sombrero Galaxy right here in the middle. You can already see it kind of very, very faint. And so what we'll do now is we'll start with our sequence that says start imaging. And remember what these sequences do, do gang. They, this sequence that says start imaging, that sets the uh, exposure to uh, 20 second time exposure and the gain to about 100. Gain more or less um, resembling what you know, what you see in a camera when you talk about ISO. That's a kind of a similar idea. Now this is a different part of the sky, and we're seeing different parts of sky glow, so we do have to do another color match here, a color balance. And so we'll bring our mids over here and our black point, and use that to kind of set the contrast. What's going to be the black point? How much sky glow are we going to consider acceptable? And most people consider just barely over to the left of that peak. Um, and see what you guys have. Rock says, hey Doug, do you take darks or flats before you start your live stacking? Yes, we do. We're using both darks and flats. Um, they're, they're automatically 
uh, accessed by SharpCap, and we take an entire library of them, and SharpCap files them away, and then automatically takes care of choosing which is the most appropriate to be able to use for the time exposure that we're, we're using. Thanks for asking that, Rock. Blayboy, hey, if y'all are enjoying this, why not sharing it on your Facebook? Oh my goodness. Blayboy, I am gonna have to send you one of Mariana's donuts. That is so nice of you, Don. See that little fuzz, that's it, right. Facebook don't like me, so no sharing for me. Andy, don't do Facebook. Scott C, hello, Doug from Hazy Niagara, Canada. It's probably the mist rising up and the maid of the mist is looking at the night sky through the mist. Blayboy, haha Don, I stay on warning level, almost banned. Don, if I'm driving, I prefer, prefer tons of sky glow. <laughs> if you're driving. Uh, Jen doesn't do Facebook either. All right, so as we're live stacking, it's uh, enabling us to be able to see more of this. So let's zoom in now. And why don't we change our title to be able to match what we're looking at here. This is... Um, M104, isn't it? Yeah, M104, the Sombrero Galaxy, a, an edge-on Spiral Galaxy. And so we'll zoom in on this now. I think this is a pretty majestic sight for a couple of reasons. First it is, I wonder if I get rid of these for a second. Is that the way we're going to leave that? Let's bring... Let's bring the mids up a little more. So we make this a little bit brighter. Something like that. Now I wonder if I get rid of this and this and then make this bigger for a minute. Does that help you guys? It doesn't really, does it? It doesn't really make the image any bigger, does it? It just expands the window through which you're viewing, so I don't know if there's a lot is gained by hiding those panels. Instead, it just makes it hard for us to find it the next time <laughs> when we have to make these adjustments. So let's, there we go. Okay, so this is the M104, the Sombrero Galaxy, and we can actually bring our observing panel over here. And no really description here, other than just the fact that it has an apparent magnitude of nine. And you can see it's up about 30 degrees in the night sky. Oh, here we go. The galaxy diameter is 89,000 light years. And for comparison, I think our Milky Way is estimated to be about 100,000. So it's not quite as big as the Milky Way. The galaxy thickness, and I forget who this was that asked this a while ago. Was it you, Dane? I can't remember. Uh, 19,692 light years thick. So about 20,000. So that's thicker than the Milky Way, which is, I think, Help correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's about 10,000 light years thick. Let's do a log entry here and say we could clearly make out the racing stripe across the edge on Sombrero galaxy. Magnificent sight. Magnif magnificent, magnificent sight. Indeed, magnificent sight. Now you notice it is very vertical for us tonight. Uh, I kind of think that it's, if you tilt your head and see it sideways, it always reminds me a little bit more of a flying saucer, you know. Let's see what you guys are saying here. Uh, what is sky glow? Jen, that's not a dumb question. Don, what's the weather like in Niagara? What do we call you, Doug or Don? Um, I'm Doug. Uh, Don is 
Jumping in with extra, extra help here. Thank you, Don. Sky glow is the natural emission of light by the atmosphere, normally greenish or reddish. It's best seen in videos from the ISS. It's a greenish band of light most prominent in the upper atmosphere. Don nailed it. I'm not going to just, I mean, I can't add a thing. Uh, so cool, though. I asked to see this 10 minutes ago, and I'm seeing it in real time. This is amazing. Scott C., not a bad night. Clear but hazy. That must be a Niagara. Flatwater 5, I don't do, oh, we're talking about Facebook there. Don Sabero's a cool galaxy. That's central dust lane. Scott C., a balmy 57 degrees for the motorcycle ride home tonight. Cool, Scott. Don, it was just above 80 and nice. Sunny here in Idaho. 80 degrees. That's nice. Don, I'm a nobody. No, but you are because you came up with this great answer on what sky glow is. I'll tell you where else you can see sky glow really well. Right there. See that like light pollution? That light pollution bounces around all of the all of the sky and generates a sky glow, by the way. Now down in the lower left uh, corner, you can see the edges of the observatory. Uh, maybe a little bit better seen right here. That's not a live view. That's actually just a photo of the observatory. But that's the way it looks right now. If, if we were to have a live camera in that corner looking at it right there, that is what this PureTech Telestation 2 observatory looks like. It's a roll-off roof observatory. So you can see how the entire roof rolls off. And then we have a PureTech 2 um, height adjustable pier. And of course, you guys know already, I don't want to insult you, the pier is the, the column on which the telescope is mounted. And this column is unique because PureTech makes this height adjustable one so that you can actually like pump it up. You know, you like imagine with an inner tube pump and you just keep pumping and it raises it so the telescope actually rises above the rim of this observatory by means of this height adjustable pier. It adjusts up like, I forget, like, I don't know, 40 inches or something like that. And then on top of the uh, pier tech height adjustable pier is the, the rasa. And maybe you can see it a little bit clearer here. There is actually a black, uh, it's called a pier extension. And you can see that right on top of that uh, height adjustable pier. And then is the mount. And the mount is all that hunk of metal that points the telescope. You can see it has counterweights here off to the right. And uh, it has computer control so that it points the telescope fairly accurately, I'd have to say. And then the actual thing that we normally call a telescope, call a telescope is actually the optical tube assembly of the Rasa 11, the Celestron Rowe Ackerman Schmidt Astrograph Telescope. The Rasa stands for Rowe Ackerman Schmidt Astrograph. Rowe being and, and uh, Ackerman, those are the two guys who, who uh, consulted together with Celestron to design this optical tube assembly. So that's the whole thing that we're using to be able to get this view. And uh, the way we got on this, we were looking at this sky glow, all that light pollution mixes in with the, with the sky to be able to see um, all of that confetti-like stuff that now fades out. We've been nine minutes on this um, sombrero galaxy. Now, you can see why they call it a sombrero. If you turn your head one way or the other, hopefully it does look like a sombrero. You'll have to decide how much it really looks like a sombrero. Let me see what you guys are, are saying here. Scott, see, we, we had rain off and on. Jen, Jen, thank you. Jen0714, thank you for asking. The Trippy Traveler. Hello again. Good to have you back. Flatwater 5. It must have been Mooglow that led me straight to you. I think you're quoting from another song now. Uh, Don says, what I want to see is zodiacal light. Uh, not sure I've ever seen it. Oh, and noctilucent clouds. Yeah, I don't know if we're going to be able to show you zodiacal light uh, from Louisville tonight, but someday maybe. Michael One Eden, such a good idea. Um, Eric Langley, awesome. Eric, where are you observing from? Remind us, please. Don, you're kind to encourage about the setup. Uh, Michael, you too as well. Blayboy, I got $30 pair of binoculars. Watch birds in the front yard with <laughs> Blayboy, we'll keep you on here for comic relief. Uh, Jen0714, it does. It looks like a sombrero. Woohoo! Jen, thanks for supporting the astral community who, who named this by that name. Okay, we're going to 
save a picture of this exactly seen. That's uh, M104, again, the Messier list of, of deep space objects assembled by Charles Messier in the mid to late 1700s. Uh, this one he named M04. Actually, this, you want to know the truth about this object? He didn't name this M104. There were a group of people who found his observations of this object in his log, and he only published 100 objects. I guess he wanted to have a nice round number. But in the 1960s, this group of observers and researchers who studied his logbooks found that he observed this object, so they gave it the name M104 on his behalf. And that way it became Messier 104. Kind of an interesting little uh, fun story. Did we take a picture of this? I can't remember if we did or not. Okay, there it goes. Now let's uh, go back to our um, next target. And uh, not your grandmother's rock and roll, M104. <laughs> you guys are a <laughs> riot. I love song references, Jen says. Song references every five minutes. Love it. Eric, you're from Minnesota. Good to have you here. Uh, Don, he made the list because the sky records were so messy, eh? <laughs> nice. Okay, so we're uh, ready to go to the next object. Let's go back to lists. What we do here in Starlight Pro is we go to the best deep space objects, and it does all of our sorting again. By the way, if you've never subscribed to... Um, Emerald Hill Skies before, I'm just going to kind of like humbly ask if you wouldn't mind doing that. This does bump up the uh, channel in uh, everybody's searches. And if you're watching this as recorded video, thank you for jumping on board. You could still subscribe if you wanted to. And if it's not too much, it won't cost you anything. You could hit that thumbs up. And also click that bell if you want to be notified when we're doing content like this. We try to do this once a week at least, whenever there are clear skies. Okay, so now we've got our list. We've already gone to the Whirlpool and the Sunflower, right? Um, now the Spindle Galaxy is interesting. Let's go to the Spindle Galaxy. How about that? So we're going to center on the Spindle Galaxy. We're going to slew to the Spindle Galaxy. We're going to let you see the scope while it slews. We're going to Click it on there, and we're going to open up the info pane about it. This is M102. It's a spiral galaxy, and it lies right on tonight, the meridian. Now let's let's see here. Um, I'm going to back off a little bit and see. So this is the north azimuth the north compass bearing. You can see the north star here, Polaris, that makes the beginning of the Little Dipper. And you can see the Big Dipper here. See the handle of the Big Dipper? And that's a part of this bigger constellation, Ursa Major. So what we're doing is we're right above that here in the Spindle Galaxy. Let's go over and switch. Um, we're not going to we're not going to uh, do a plate solve this time because surely we're close enough. Yeah, I see it right here. So um, let's just start our um, imaging sequence. And that'll start our live stack. Now let's go back here. See how sometimes I have to click on this window, Starry Night Pro. So. I love this program, Star Night Pro Plus. If you guys have been on the channel before, you know it's my favorite. But sometimes it's just cantankerous to get to it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Please forgive me. So you have to go down here and click. And you know what? You can't alt tab. I'm, I'm alt tabbing now. It won't let you alt tab to it. Look. Oh my goodness, it let me. Thank you, simulation curriculum. I'm wrong. It did work this time. Okay, so let's zoom in a little bit so we see the spindle galaxy. You see why they call it a spindle galaxy? Because it's also very thin. And let's back off just for a minute and one more time see the way the Big Dipper, see how the open bowl here is like pouring into the, the Little Dipper? They're always looking like that. One of, the, one of them is always pouring into the other one. 
And remember, you can take these two stars. You guys all know this. I don't want to insult you. Oh, I'm going to say it anyway. Take these two stars on the end. What is that? Mirak and Doobie. Um, Scooby Dooby Doo. You point through Doobie and it points at Polaris. And then uh, Polaris, remember, curves around, makes a little dipper. Well, if you um, go above the bowl of the little dipper, you'll see the Spino Galaxy here tonight. That's where we are. Now let's go over and see. Let's get rid of this. And let's do a color balance. Yep, there it is. And we're going to take our blacks and scoot them over right about here. And then this is a fairly small object, isn't it? Let's go in at 100%. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. It just looks like a flying saucer. If you didn't know better, wouldn't that look like we were being invaded tonight by extraterrestrials? We're going to pump these mids up a little bit. Bump the red level down just one hair. All this is to taste. You know, there's no right or wrong about these sliders. Everybody does them different. What I'm trying to do is bump it up, bump it up, bump it off high enough that uh, you can see it on the uh, YouTube stream. Let me see what you guys are saying about this. Um, Eric, thanks, good stuff. Cotton Top 82, good to have you aboard. Cotton Top 82, if you've not said yet where you're observing from, please let us know what your town is. What's the coolest looking galaxy you've ever viewed, in your opinion? You know, I would say the coolest looking galaxy is the one I'm looking at right now. <laughs> in other words, you can always use that answer. The one I'm looking at right now is always the coolest because they all look cool to me. So this is M102, and I see right now we need to change our, our little title down here, don't we? M102, um, and this is called the Spindle Galaxy. The Spindle Galaxy, an edge-on spiral. Okay, now back to the screen. You know what I haven't been doing horribly? I haven't been putting the target names up here. <laughs> Boy, that's a big error on my part. That'll ask me, do you want to change the name of that when you save. Sorry about that. I haven't been putting the names in Chirp Cup. Um, what's the coolest thing? Don, Rock M104, it's out of this world. Michael and Eden, Nebulas, on the hunt for Nebulas. Let's go there next. Let's go to a Nebula. Flatwater 5, interestingly enough, Mark Messier also played for the New York Rangers, the Vancouver Canucks, and the Edmonton Oilers. Flatwater 5, how do you find this stuff? Maybe Mark Messier is a I'm just going to say distant relative, but I started to say great, 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 great. Uh, I don't know. It's a big sky, Michael says. Don froze up. Flatwater 5, ha. Huh? Flatwater 5, the Doobie Brothers. There you go. Another song reference. Playboy, let's just assume some of us know nothing. Completely new to stargazing. Just for the sake of assumption, you are so kind to ask that. Flatwater 5, wow. Don, spindly. Uh, Phoebe, yeah, it does. It looks like ET phone home and flying saucer. Exactly. Cotton Top is from North Alabama. I believe I remember you mentioning that now. Oh, maybe it was Blayboy who said he was from South Alabama. That's what I think I remember. Let's look at the Spindle Galaxy in the description. M102 is probably a mistake. Well, there you go. Messi most likely recorded a duplicate observation of M101 and never saw the galaxy, which we now call M102, also known as NGC 5866. This is a large edge-on lenticular galaxy with a thin, dark lane visible in larger telescopes under dark skies. Can you guys see that? Let's zoom in using our, our uh, digital zoom. See if you can see that thin, dark lane. Can I see it? You can almost see it better when we go back to the pure optical resolu resolution. It's just that it's so small on your frame, isn't it? Um, 
A small telescope reveals an elongated glow, gradually brightening toward its center. M102 is the brightest member of a large group of galaxies, the NGC 5866 group. Okay, let's do a, um, an observation of this. We could clearly make out the very thin racing stripe across the edge on disk. Looked like a flying saucer. So there you go. M102, beautiful. The Spindle Galaxy. Let's do a picture. And let's see what you guys are saying. It does look dense. Barely, it's there. Looks almost like Saturn looking sideways. Right, Phoebe? How about M106? Okay, we're going to stop live stacking. Set the sequencer on next target. I'm going to go over here. Say M106. It's doable. It's doable, Azray. Let's go there. So we're going to go SLU to M106. And you can see here, we were zoomed in quite a bit, but you can see All right, there it is. So let's do a plate solve just to make that correction. It'll pull that hopefully back up in the middle of the frame and make our mount more accurate with tracking. Uh, with all of the satellites in the skies, does that pose a problem on spotting targets? Andy, that's a good question. You know, I don't think uh, that they pose a problem with spotting targets. I think they, though, pose a problem for astrophoto purists who don't like satellite trails. But see, in their case, astrophotographers are gathering all the frames that we're stacking. And um, in their case, they, are, they just discard those frames. So it really doesn't, um, in my opinion, pose a terrible problem. But in our case with um, electronically assisted astronomy, we're not uh, able to toss the frames as easily. Now I know I mentioned earlier in the broadcast, there is this thing called sigmoid clipping down here that we could try. And if you guys want, we can experiment with that. Let's experiment with it. That drops out frames that don't match other frames. So we can try that out. Is this another galaxy down here, by the way? Look at that. Let's go look at that. Now, see, right now I click on, I'm clicking on the planetarium software, and it's not coming. There it went. So clicking on the title bar in that case helped. So what is that other galaxy that we're seeing down here? It's also edge on. Would that be, oh, right here it is, NGC 4217. NGC 4217. You know, if we ever have problems like this, we can't get it to let us see the thing that we want to see. There are a couple of options. You can say select others, and let's select 4217. Then it, it makes it the selection. And then we can show the info about it. It's a spiral galaxy. It doesn't say anything about it. Well, that's it. But we did have an observation of it once. We at first just gravitated M106, but finally realized NGC 4217 was edge on right in the center. <laughs> so on uh, April 30th, 2021, I observed this little galaxy. I just had forgotten about it. Saw this galaxy again tonight in the uh, M106 frame. 
So let's make our title M106. M106 and we're going to say um, A spiral galaxy. Let's change our sharp cat name to M106. This is a nice galaxy. Who was it suggested this? Was that you, Azray? Yes, Azray. It's a good idea. You recently imaged this. It's in your astro bin. Um, yeah, Don, good point. Unless a Starlink train comes whizzing by. Scott C, NGC 6888. You're saying that was the little galaxy down there at the bottom. Good catch. Don, I think the software is taxing your processor so it lags behind your command. Uh, you're saying you think Starry Night Pro was not clicking live. But what I'm telling you is from having used this planetarium software, it has a problem in its... Windows behavior, and I've reported it to Simulation cur Curriculum, and Simulation Curriculum answered very quickly and said, this is a known problem, we need to fix it. So they've acknowledged that it doesn't behave correctly. You can't select it with a click often, and you can't all tab to it consistently, and they're going to fix it. It's just a matter of time. So in our histogram here, let's bring our blacks up. Now, what do you think about the color matching? We could probably do a little bit better job. Let's zoom in to 100%. Wow, this is a nice, this is a nice galaxy. We'll increase the contrast a little so that we can distinguish its spiral structure, which is very faint. And then let's pump up the spiral structure some. Wow, this looks like something out of Star Wars, doesn't it? You know, like uh, Lando Calrissian's whatever among the clouds deal. That could very well have been his hideout. That's his, I think that's his uh, official hideout. M106. It's a large, bright spiral galaxy visible in binoculars. Telescopically, it has a large and mottled MOTTL LED uh, nuclear region surrounded by a much fainter elongated halo. A larger telescope in dark skies reveal two spiral arms extending from the central region of the halo. Bright blue knots at the end of the spiral arms mark sites of star formation, but these can usually be seen only in photographs. Bright blue knots at the end of the spiral arms. Bright blue knots. I'm going to pump up the blues. One. Nah, that didn't help. So it's basically saying out here there are knots of star formation. And my, my theory would be that electronically assisted astronomy helps you see those way earlier than if you were looking through an eyepiece. Can you look for Zeta Reticuli? Tommy, good to have you aboard. I don't know if I've ever done that. Julio, hello from Shelbyville. Julio, mucho, mucho gusto. Es un placer encontrarle. Thanks for being on board with us tonight. Um, Blayboy had to go. Thanks for wanting my appetite for stargazing. Well, Blayboy, thanks for the tremendous comic relief you add to these. Flower to five, is there a black hole at the center of every galaxy? I don't think that it's the center of every galaxy because some galaxies are particularly flat and, and without very much of a bulge there and without very much of a big, uh, you know, starry center. Those wouldn't, but a lot of the ones with the big hub in the middle would. Zeta Reticuli, black screen, Flatwater 5, long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. That's exactly it, Flatwater 5. Don, you're stuck in the title screen. Oh my goodness, <laughs> so sorry. Thank you. 
you know, actually, uh, Don, if, if you wouldn't mind, help me catch that, because I do that occasionally. So sorry. Tommy Black Screen. Debbie. Be right back. It's ISS and grab another beer time. Debbie, I'm sure that you'll come back with a report of the ISS. It's awesome. Flatwater 5. This is a close-up of a very empty quadrant of space. <laughs> Rub it in, Flatwater 5. Andy, what type of PC are you using? Would a gamer PC with Windows 11 work on this application? The answer is, Andy, yes. Because oftentimes gamer PCs do have uh, faster processors with graphics capabilities, and that doesn't hurt a bit for these applications. I'm using a ThinkPad T14 with a fast V Pro i7. Uh, so in other words, it's a fast i7 processor. And this laptop does have a lot of RAM. So it does allow this multitasking really well. Uh, people tell me, though, that these programs work on, uh, you know, lesser uh, endowed laptops. You don't need to have a super expensive video, discrete video card laptop in order to run these. Maybe Starry Night Pro Plus runs better for me because I have a little bit more graphics capability on this laptop, but with the exception of Starry Night Pro Plus, everything else would run on just about any uh, laptop. Uh, Phoebe, Black Hole. Yeah, that's like, the Black Hole sucks a lot of, oh, I see you're making fun of the fact that I left the screen black. Uh-huh, you guys rubbing it in now. Don, yes, Andy, it would. David, help, I've gone blind. I can't see anything. You guys are still rubbing it in. Azrae, just seeing black screen. Armando, muchos saludos, un gran abrazo. Gracias por venir. Armando, bienvenido. ¿De dónde eres? ¿De dónde vives, por favor? Flatwater 5, I thought it was just a little bit of your sickness kicking up. Azrae, got it. Andy laughed, I think, because I left the screen off. Mariana, hey, 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 I'm here. Chat. Have donuts. I'm ready. Flower to five. Sorry, that's not funny. Um, Tommy. Zeta Reticuli. Bob Laser said that's where the aliens come from, at least the ones we have the ships from. Okay, let's look for it. Don. Lovely progress on the photo. Azra Amaran, a gamer PC with Windows 10. Uh, Jen. So is it safe for me to assume that we don't know how many galaxies there are? Actually, there are guesses on that. But here's my private opinion. They're just guesses, and we haven't yet seen the edge of the known universe. All we've seen is the edge of how much light has reached us so far. So you are right. There would not be any way that people could accurately assess how many galaxies there are in all the universe. Phoebe, ooh, that one is pretty. Right, this is M106. I think Azrae suggested this, so thank you. We're going to go back down to the 100 percent view so you can see it at native optical and that should be the best you know sharpest image flumani flumani um, yeah it looks like flumani is asking you're asking what will these discs become and i think the, the truth of the matter is, although we're still experimenting with that, these disks will stay disks. Um, they formed into disks because of the motion of the objects in them, and they're going to stay disks for the most part. Flumani, thanks so much for the encouragement over that last stream. It was a lot of fun, and you guys are kind to come back tonight. Uh, Azra uses Nina because uh, nighttime Im imaging and astronomy works great for a sequence of astrophotos. Armando is in Chihuahua. <clears throat> Ay, Chihuahua, Armando, bienvenido entonces. Gracias por venir otra vez. Mariana, Mexico presen presente. Mariana, bienvenida. Es un placer tenerle aquí. <coughs> Scott Zeta is a southern target. Seuss Among Us, good to have you back. I saw you the other night. Hello, hello. Tommy, binary star system, Zeta Reticuli. All right, so this is M106. We've done about 11 minutes. Let's save this exactly a scene. And then we'll switch to our 
we'll switch to our um, next target sequence. And we've got um, about 30 minutes left, so let's try to go to Zeta Reticuli. Zeta Reticuli. How about that? Not found. So let's go out to um, Wikipedia. Boy, that's bright, isn't it? Zeta Reticuli. Zeta Reticuli. Wiki. Zeta Reticuli, Latinized Zeta Reticuli, is a wide binary star system in the southern constellation Reticulum. From the southern hemisphere, the pair can be seen with the naked eye as a double star and very stark. It's like about 39 light years. Both stars are solar analogs that have characteristics similar to the sun. Hmm. Bob Lazar claimed the craft he says he studied was from Zeta Reticuli. Seriously? As an American conspiracy theorist and criminal who claims to have been hired in the late 1980s to reverse engineer extraterrestrial technology at what he described as a secret site called S4. He alleges that the subsidiary installation, well, that's just really interesting. Uh, so, to find this reticuli, it's not even finding that. Let's see if we can find another designation. We might be able to find the HR designation or maybe the HD. Let's try HD 20766. GC 20766. Not so lucky. Hipparchus 15330. We might be able to find that. 15330. 15330. Rats, no Hipparchus. HR1006. I don't think that HR is going to be in. Tarnay Pro, HR1006, no. Boy, we're going to have to get the coordinates to this and do this the hard way. Reticulum, so this is right here. So what we do when we don't have the address, we go to Starry Night and you can go to this thing called Cinturon. It's Control U. And we just put this on J2000, and we do this as the right ascension. And then we grab the declination. Again, it's not letting me click back to it. So I'm going to try using this. Boy, it's being stubborn. Let me make this minimized and again poke that in there. Sadly, it's not above the horizon right now. In fact, it is so southerly, I'm not sure we'll ever see it from the northern hemisphere. It's sad to say. Okay, did we do an observation yet on M106? Let's do one real quick. Um, this was, oh, that's the Black Eye Galaxy. We already did that, didn't we? No, sorry. M106, beautiful. Um, almost misty looking spiral arms. Let's close that one. Now let's go back here to um, our lists. 
where we see best deep space objects. Let's for, look for a nebula. Someone is asking about a nebula log home. We can see the M106 just with a three second exposure. Let me see what you guys are seeing. Yes. Zeta is a southern target. No. Yes. <laughs> You're absolutely right, Scott. Um, we're products, not consumers. Emerald Disguises, that's saying about there are more stars and grains of sand actually true. I'm not sure what the exact saying is. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we're products, not consumers. If you were to add up all the visible stars in your half of the night sky, you might see two to 3,000 if you were in completely dark sky. If you're in a city or a city environs, it just drops way down. I mean, we might see 200 stars here in Louisville because the skies are so polluted with light. Too cloudy for ISS. Um, Crescent Nebula, NGC 6888. Crescent Nebula, NGC 6888, yes, center on that. We wanted to go to a nebula anyway, didn't we? So there it goes. See, we're going... back over in the easterly direction. So we're in Cygnus now, the swan. And let's salute that. Open up the info pane. Crescent Nebula was on this in April. Wow, we saw this right away in the first frame. Wow, the lower left-hand side, the west side, Looked a lot like a flamethrower, but really all of this was incredible. When first slewed there, scope didn't find it. Had to re slew and resolve. Beautiful nebula. Wow. Saw the whole crescent. Amazing. So we viewed this about four times over the last year. This is a beautiful target for sure. Okay, we should be now pointed in the basic environs. Let's go back out and do one more plate solve just to make sure that we're spot on. We're probably not, don't take everything Wikipedia says is true, especially when you're looking at people. Gotcha. All right. Um, Jer Dash B28, welcome from Indiana. I'm from Indiana originally. Southern part, Jackson County. Don, hi Jared, like the stream, please. That uh, would be very nice of you if you did that. Flat water five. Chair Dashby. Debbie, it's really nice of you to welcome people. But the earth is flat. <laughs> Don, Scott wants in GC 6888. Um, Phoebe, Misty and the Stars at Night, you're right. Only up 17 degrees. Eagle Nebula M16, do you use any filters? Yes, that's actually a really good question, Scott. We constantly run the Celestron light pollution filter. This is NGC 6888. Down here we're gonna say in the title, NGC 6888, the Crescent Nebula. Okay, so let's do our sequencer on start imaging. Now this target to me is very difficult at first. Um, I think it's just fainter, but man, with you know, ten minutes, this 
This is a beautiful, beautiful nebula. South Texas, Jorge, bienvenido. M57. That celestron light filter, Scott, we were going to say that. That celestron light filter is made specifically for the Ross 11. And uh, I've just decided I'm just going to roll with it the whole time. Checking in from South Texas. Phoebe, are the stars out tonight? I don't care if it's cloudy or bright because they all disappear from view because I only have eyes for you. Wow! I wonder what what lyric that is. This is a great Friday night. Galaxy gazing and <laughs> you guys, Flatwater 5. Actually, the stars at night are big and bright, deep in the heart of Texas. Nice, Flatwater 5. Dear Ashley, supernova. We did see a supernova just a couple of weeks ago. Azray, it's right in the center of the screen. You might need to increase the exposures. Right, it's going to be viewable, viewable for us, isn't it? We're going to see it. You see why they call it the Crescent Nebula? We are at our last 20 minutes. If you guys would be so kind, we have several watching. If you wouldn't mind, if you haven't subscribed yet, it would be wonderful if you could subscribe. And it doesn't cost you anything. You could always unsubscribe later, but what it does is it bumps up the channel in people's um, searches if they're searching for things that are astronomy-related hum. And if you hit that bell, even better, because that shows that you like this kind of content. And then, of course, you could always do the thumbs up if you like. Um, the thumbs up shows that you like the content. The bell shows that you will be notified. Uh, let's see if we can get rid of the sky glow again in this and just make it a dark sky. A little bit darker. And then let's bring up our levels and hope to preserve Oh, oh yeah, look at that. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Let's bring the blues down just a shade since they're kind of invading. And you see by keeping the reds up, it emphasizes, I think this is mostly hydrogen anyway. And hydrogen usually comes across as red to our cameras and also, you know, in astrophotography when we stack, it comes across as red. Now, if we were to look at this with a human eye through a lens, it would not be red like this. It would usually just stay a faint glow, a little splotch. This is two minutes of integration time. And let's do a new log entry here and say, this crescent nebula is amazing. I mean, it's just a, an entire bow of gaseous hydrogen being lit up, probably by this star here. Let's go over to the starry night. Oh. And let's look at the info one more time. NGC 6888 Cygnus is an emission nebula known as Crescent Nebula from its distinctive shape. It's located 5,000 light years from the sun. In the telescope, it appears as a faint curved wisp through a parallelogram of stars. A narrow band nebula filter and really dark skies are essential to spot it. This nebula consists of gas emitted by a wolf rayet star at its center, whose radiation also causes the nebula to glow. Beautiful. Beautiful. And that's just four minutes. I think this is the best we've ever seen. Oh my goodness, look what Flatwater 5 did. I've never even seen this before, Flatwater 5. What do you call this thing? Okay, I gotta figure this out. Let me get caught back up. Um I figure Rasa has to be better for it than my uh, Williams Optics 81 millimeter. It is gorgeous. You're right, Jen. Flower five saw a falling star burning high above the Las Vegas sands. With apologies to Joni Mitchell. <laughs> That's song lyrics night, isn't it? 
Don Kornstrom, nice. Very kind of you, Don, to encourage. Flatwater 5, subscribe, last stream. This channel is so cool. Flatwater 5, you rock. Thanks for the encouragement, because I kind of have a low self-esteem closet. Low self Dane says, how do I donate? We don't really have a donation mentality here because I don't want you guys to think that we're in it for the money, but it looks like Flatwater 5 figured out a way. Uh, Andy Crabtee, there's an observatory south of Fort Smith, Arkansas at an old farm. They turned the grain silo into the observatory by making the top able to rotate while using an 18-inch mirror telescope. That's cool. Okay, so Flatwater 5, what did you do here? What is this thing that you did for $10? I don't know, I have any idea. Phoebe, oh wow, isn't that something? Anna Fialo, Fiajo. Ana Fiajo. Hola, saludos desde República Dominicana. Disfruto mucho tus transmisiones. Pero el placer es nuestro, Ana. Eh, mucho gusto, encantado conocerle. Por favor, que venga. Que venga toda la República Dominicana. Uh, Scott says, Doug, you're giving me aperture envy. You know, I hate to say it, isn't it? I had an 8-inch rasa. And when I realized that an 11 inch doesn't just add three inches, an 11 inch doubles the light gathering capacity of the eight inch. It's just incredible what that extra inch, the, the extra three inches adds. It's double the light gathering. Um, Jen is saying, I can't find the button, Flatwater 5. Don says, good one, Flat. Oh my goodness, Beppy says, best live stream of all time. This cannot be true, because the truth is, but he's, I am going to be honest with you, I am clueless about live streaming. But it's very kind of you to say this. Flower 5, Jen says, see the dollar sign right below the chat entry line to the right of the smiley emoji. I'm going to go look at this because I have no idea what he found. How do I go to this? Can I just open up a, a live stream of this? Can I open up a live stream to... Uh, so if I go to um, HTTPS, uh, YouTube.com, Emerald Hill Skies, can we do a live stream of a live stream? <laughs> there it is. So can I do this? This will be bad, won't it? Let me make sure that I just want to know where this is. Okay, so there's that. How about if we pause it? Now you're saying that over by the chat, see the dollar sign right below the chat entry line. Oh my goodness, right there, isn't it? It says, show your support for Emerald Hill Skies. <laughs> I didn't even know what that was. And what is this? Add reaction. Oh my goodness, that's so cool. And what is this? Create a poll. You guys are just teaching me all kinds of things. So if you do this, what happens? Flatwater 5. 5,000 plus views, Azri. That is a super sticker, and yes. Nice to have so many viewers, usually just the normal 10 of us. Right, <laughs> you're right, Scott. Azray, in deeper reach, Scott C, 11 inches of light bucket. Very kind of you to encourage. Click on that dollar sign, it will give you a menu of super sticker options ranging from $2, $5 and up. Dave Baker, everyone here rocks. What a great group of people. I wish I could invite you all over for a pool party. Now that is what would rock, Debbie. Uh, Flatwater 5, just below the line where you're typing. You can, Debbie. It just might be a long drive. <laughs> Flower five. Left side, right below the chat line. See the smiley face. Look to the right of the dollar sign and click on. Yes, sir. Next to the e emojis. Great live scene so far. Keep up the good work. Bobby, thank you. Where are you observing from, Bobby? Flower five. Some allow you to create an individual message right below where it says say something. I think you have lots of new options with hitting. Oh, I bet you're right, Scott. That's exactly what it is. I had, until this past, whatever night that was, was that Monday night? I believe we had 760 subscribers until that night. J1NX, man, you're the best person in the whole wide world. Love your streams, watched since day one. You're kidding. Well, 
I'm telling you, you guys are just too amazing. Um, I'm going to close this because we don't need to be looking at that live stream. And I'm going to go minimize this again. And I'm going to look one more time. We've now got 10 minutes on the Crescent Nebula. And this is looking, you know, not too shabby, is it? Not too shabby at all. Let's add back just a shade of sky glow. No, that's too much. Oh, I tell you, let's pump, let's try pumping out the mids just one more notch. This is beyond the shadow of a doubt. The least worst crescent nebula that we've ever had here at Emerald Hill Skies. Uh, NG 6888 is up there. We're going to save at 10 minutes. Can you believe that you can see this kind of object with just 10 minutes integration? Okay, we have 12 minutes left. Um, I don't remember if somebody suggest. Oh my goodness, Jen. You just did that again. Okay, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, guys. Here's my commitment. I am going to, if, if, if somehow YouTube does ever give this to this channel, we are going to give any dollars that come in to help with refugees. Uh, because I just read today that, that literally today we topped 100 million refugees in the world. Now, most of those are in Africa. We are hearing more about the ones coming across the border from Ukraine, and that's horrible. What are there? 10 million now plus. Uh, coming across the borders of Ukraine to seek, uh, you know, refuge. But actually, there are more refugees, if you look across Africa, even than that. So any, I don't even know how this money is going to come, if it ever comes to this channel. But if it ever comes, I pledge, Scout's Honor, I am not going to take this personally. You guys are too cool, and I am not in it to try to make a fast buck or whatever. If this ever happens, my pledge to you is, this is going to go to refugee relief. And, uh, and thank you for making this possible. Um, so, Flatwater 5, and then showed us how to do that. Uh, Jen, it's amazing, Jen. Phoebe subbed! I hope you will come back. 3,820 subscribers is just so radical, Andy, because we had 760 Monday night. Uh, least of these put the most amazing bunch of star points and lightning bolts I've ever seen with lots of doves. Very cool. I figured out. Thank you, Flatwater5. Currently watching in Greenland. Oh, get out of town, Bobby. You are not in Greenland. You are no way in Greenland. That is so crazy. Jen says, I want to visit Greenland. <laughs> Field trip to go visit J1. I'm sorry. To visit Bobby Bobby Babinski. You don't have to live like a refugee. With apologies to Tom Petty. <laughs> that must be another song lyric. Oh my goodness, we just have nine minutes left. Did we save this? Let's save this one more time. This is the least worst image ever of Crescent Nebula. I want you to know that when I started out in astronomy, which is literally just 18 months ago, <laughs> with a Rasa 8, I couldn't even get this image to come out at all. I mean, I, I worked, and I worked, and I worked, and I never did. I, I never did see it. I wonder if that's recorded over here anywhere. I don't know. 2021, April 2nd. Yeah, I didn't find it at first. It does say that it became beautiful, but then when I came later, I'm saying here, saw the whole crescent because I was so shocked that at least I could see it. But now tonight, this is incredible. Um, the amount of red hydrogen, I think this is hydrogen 2, it's called, being... Uh, illuminated, well, let's call it ionized here. We're seeing it as ionized. You know what this would remind us of? 
is the uh, same process. It is incredible. It's the same process you see in a neon light. It's uh, lit, it's 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 lit up by a electric spark, so to speak. Look, there's the here's the astrophotographer's version. That that probably is six hours worth of data. And look what this Ross 11 did in 15 minutes. I tell you what, with deep respect, this is the most amazing telescope I've seen. Look at what it can do in 11 minutes time, or 15 minutes now. Okay, so we're gonna switch this to the uh, next target mode, and then we're gonna go back to the stream and say, was there something else you guys were wanting to see? I bet, uh, let's see, you should bet the skies in Greenland are amazing. Love my Tom Petty, watching from New Zealand. Stu, P, good to have you aboard. Jen says, I love New Zealand. Jen, I think you would probably just hop on a plane and go anywhere you had the chance, and that's great. Beppies, no, you have to stop. Yeah, we're going to stop at one. So sorry. But if I, can you tell him how to get the... Yeah, Jen is saying, Jen is saying, Flatwater 5, he is clueless about getting this money. He doesn't have any idea how this is going to come. How did you get into this, Doug? When I was in seventh grade... I remember getting interested in astronomy because of a book that I think an, an, maybe a sister-in-law bought me for a Christmas gift. But I've always been interested in astronomy. And I remember making a telescope when I was a kid out of the makeup mirror in my mom's bathroom. She never got her makeup mirror back and the telescope didn't turn out too well. But it's kind of, it kind of pricked my interest. And then it went latent for a long time. I was living overseas, different places. Uh, and it's really just fired back up a year and a half ago. And I tell you why, I had an old, old, old telescope, and I was showing it to a homeschooling group, and one of the homeschooling parents said, isn't there a screen somewhere we can look at this together? And I said, oh my goodness, that's a brilliant idea. Surely there isn't, surely that isn't possible. We were all doing the eyepiece thing. And I began researching, and it was just really coming into its own, electronically assisted astronomy, EAA. So I just took the plunge, and little by little, God's helped, you know, be able to afford this. Uh, Bobby says he's originally from Poland, but have recently moved to Umanach, Greenland. That's amazing. J1NX, are you really watching Ni from Nigeria? You are pulling our leg, aren't you? What town? Flatwater 5, Cygnus X1. Is that the next target? Cygnus X1, what is that? Sounds like a jet fighter or something. Oh, we still got Ed. Let's see, Cygnus. Cygnus X1. What is that? Oh, that's a song or a. Or is it? Cygnus X1 Wiki. A galactic X ray source in the constellation Cygnus was the first such widely accepted to be a black hole discovered in 1964 during a rocket flight. It is one of the strongest X-ray sources detectable from Earth, producing a peak X-ray flux density back in the future of 2.3 times 10 to the negative 23, whatever those values are. Uh, wow, can we see this? It's been shown to be too small to be any known kind of normal star. This sounds so interesting. I've never heard of this before. Look, we can. We're slewing to Cygnus X1. Oh my goodness, this is just amazing. <laughs> okay, so where is it in this rectangle? Must be that. That's it. Hipparchus 98298. This is going to be hard to find. But let's try it. Let's try it. We have three minutes to find this baby. Um, 
Okay, so what we're going to do is compare these. I'm going to scoot this over. I'm going to compare these screens. And the thing we're looking for here is Hipparchus 98298. That's Cygnus X1. So what we're looking for are star patterns. Like here's a star pattern with three, and there it is. Boy, that didn't take any time at all. There's the three, and then here's the star pattern with this little, there's the three, and then there are these two, and then there's that, and then there's this. So right there is Cygnus X1. Cygnus X1, X-1. And then in our title, we're going to say Cygnus X-1, a large X-ray emitting star, so to speak. Now, I don't know how to annotate this for you, but I'm just going to put my point... Oh, sorry. I'm just going to put my pointer here. I could make my pointer bigger, or can you see that? I think you can see that, can't you? We're going to zoom in some more. This is Cygnus X1. And let's look at our Wikipedia page. So what is it especially? It's the first such source widely accepted to be a black hole. A galactic X-ray source that is a black hole. I can't believe, who suggested this? Was this you, Flatwater Five? Were you making up a song? Was this a song lyric and you were pulling my leg? I like the horse that nebula. We'll go there another night, Lisa. Thank you for suggesting that. Uh, Flatwater Five, sorry, I don't know how it works. Uh, me either. Different gases, different colors, Andy. Me either. I really like my Rosses. That's awesome. Azra, you've got two of them, don't you? Flower five, six stars in the Northern Cross in mourning for their sister's loss of <laughs> rush. Go wave. What if we get some stickers or t-shirts made and donate proceeds? Go wave, full agreement. If we get some stickers and t-shirts made, everything we'll send will go to refugee relief. I love it there, Phoebe Long. Why not Winona? Hi from Oregon. Good to have you aboard, Winona. Uh, how did you come up with the name Emerald Hill Skies? Well, because we're located on a campus called Emerald Hills, which is a training center for people who are going to go help in places like where they're refugees. And here at Emerald Hills, we train people to go to those places. And so it seemed only fitting when we made an observatory here for fun uh, that we would call the observatory Emerald Hill Skies. Thank you for asking that so I could tell that story. Jen, I'll have to send you a sticker for asking that question. Winona, you're lying. Well, that... You don't think we're known as from Oregon? Uh, T.A. There used to be a planetarium in Calgary. It was awesome, but closed up many years ago. That is a bummer. Least of these, God helped. I am, I would. The message is helpful for review. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, Black hole in the Northern Cross. Flatwater Five. Amazing. Holy guacamole. That's awesome. Too cool. Thank you, Neil. Have you ever tried to get a comet? Yes, we actually have some in our, we've got like 150 videos already on the channel and search for the word comet and you'll see it. Where did our, there, right there is our, right there is our Cygnus X1 star. Um, man, a lot of comments. You guys are pretty busy. Rush wrote a song about Cygnus X1. Uh, yes, Azra, I thought you had both an eight and 11. Yes, they did. Good boy. Keep up the good content. Got any badges, posted stickers, and t-shirts? <laughs> Amazing content. Great stream. Keep it up. All right, guys. This is a lot of fun. Thanks so much for being a part of this. Um, don't forget to subscribe if it's not too much trouble to ask. Thanks to God for making all this cool stuff that we could look at. We have something to be able to enjoy tonight. 
but thank you also for stopping by. If you're watching this in recorded version, thank you for stopping by. Don't forget you can hit subscribe too if you want. The thumbs up is up to you. The bell if you want to be notified. No matter what, we'll be back and see you. And each time we'll try to learn a little bit more. You guys taught me stuff tonight. I hope we're able to share back and forth with each other. God bless you guys and thanks. And have a really great evening. Thanks to all the people that do the comments. Azrae, thank you for the encouragement. All of you guys that have pitched in, honest, this means a lot. And each time we'll try to improve a lot. Thanks for your patience with me as we try to learn. It's amazing. Take care. God bless. And good night from Emerald Hills Skies.